November 15, 1864, U.S. General William T. Sherman and his troops began their infamous march to the sea. A 285-mile scorched earth campaign across the state of Georgia from the city of Atlanta to Savannah. The campaign was strategically planned to, quote, make Georgia howl by engaging in what can only be described as total warfare. The systematic destruction of everything in the Union Army's path in an effort to not only rout the Confederate Army, but also to demoralize the state's civilian population into abandoning their support of the Confederate cause. After taking hold of the vital Confederate stronghold of Atlanta several months prior, on September 2nd, the U.S. Army held the city hostage for months, evicting the city's residents and eventually dismantling anything and everything that could be used to engage in warfare after their exit. The block-by-block -block demolition was done mostly through the use of battering rams and brute force. But as the planned departure grew near, General Sherman ordered the Union engineers to set the city ablaze. Approximately 40% of the city of Atlanta was destroyed. But among the handful of buildings to survive the occupation and destruction wrought by the Union Army was the Fletcher House Hotel in nearby Marietta. A converted cotton warehouse owned by a Union sympathizer that not only served as a resting place for spies throughout the war, but also a wartime hospital and most infamously is the location where the great locomotive chase of 1862 commenced. Some claim the building was spared by order of Sherman himself, but whatever the cause, it still stands today, over a century and a half later. And just like many of the buildings and locations central to the violence and tragedy seen during the American Civil War. This building, now known as the Kennesaw House, is purportedly haunted by the men and women who once occupied it. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. In 1847, John Hayward Glover Jr. and his wife Jane Porter Bolin Glover left their home in South Carolina and moved to the upstart community of Marietta, Georgia. Glover had been doing business in the town for almost a decade prior, seizing upon the opportunities that came with Marietta's selection to be a hub for the Western and Atlantic Railroad by building a cotton warehouse next to the tracks. From this site, cotton was housed and shipped to industrial cities across the South. But at some point within the following years, Glover, who was elected Marietta's first mayor in 1852, converted his warehouse into a profitable restaurant, catering to the many passengers arriving and disembarking from the nearby train depot. Yet Glover did not retain the property for long. On May 1st, 1855, Dix Fletcher purchased the building for $12,000, which in today's currency would be upwards of $333,000. Fletcher then began to convert the building into an inn, which would aptly be called the Fletcher House Hotel, though it was more commonly known simply as the Fletcher. 
It did not take long for the Fletcher to gain a reputation as one of the finest hotels in Georgia. The building's location was a natural resting point for the many visitors who arrived via train or stagecoach in Marietta, which was attracting guests from all across the country. Some came to the town to visit the curative water spa advertised by the city's first doctor, Carrie Cox. But Marietta had also gained notoriety as a resting place for wealthy planters searching for an escape from the summer heat, insects, and malaria more commonly found along the coast. But at the onset of the Civil War, the Fletcher House Hotel began to receive a different kind of guest. Dix Fletcher was a native of Massachusetts, a staunch Unionist and an alleged Union sympathizer. And although not a spy himself, several of Fletcher's friends, and even his son-in-law, Henry Cole, were working on behalf of the Union. So the Fletcher became a natural hideout for Northern spies. Then, on April 11th, 1862, one of these spies and his men stayed the night at the Fletcher before embarking on a daring mission to steal a steam engine and destroy portions of the Western and Atlantic Railroad in an attempt to cut off the Confederate-held Chattanooga, Tennessee from receiving outside assistance. This daring mission has since become known as the Great Locomotive Chase. It was on the morning of April 12, 1862, when James J. Andrews and 18 U.S. soldiers boarded a train heading to the nearby town of Big Shanty, now named Kennesaw. There, they took control of a steam-powered locomotive named the General after secretly unhooking the passenger cars while the train was stopped for breakfast. The men then raced north towards Chattanooga, where they planned to reinforce the Union Army, who hoped to capture the city. And on their way there, they made frequent stops to destroy the train tracks, bridges, track switches, and telegraph wires, not only in an attempt to hinder anyone attempting to pursue the general by rail, but also to cut off Chattanooga from Atlanta. Of course, almost immediately after procuring the train, Andrews and the soldiers were chased by Confederate forces, first by foot, then later through a succession of other locomotives on other rail lines. But because the Union men had successfully cut the telegraph wires, Confederate troops were unable to send warning to upcoming train depots as to what was on its way. With this in mind, the Union Raiders worked to keep the general on schedule so as to maintain the appearance that nothing malicious had occurred as they stopped at the various depots along their route. Yet the general never arrived at its destination. The result of the speed at which the locomotive was forced to travel, as well as the frequent stops, caused the general to run out of fuel just 18 miles short Chattanooga. So Andrews and the Union soldiers were forced to abandon the steam engine, and within two weeks, Confederate forces captured the men. Andrews was among a group of eight who were executed for the crime, while five others managed to escape north to Union territory, and six were held as prisoners of war before ultimately being used as part of a prisoner exchange in March of 1863. In spite of the failure of James Andrews and his men, the Fletcher House Hotel continued on as a hotbed for Union spies to convene. But due to its size, the Fletcher was eventually used by the Confederate Army as a hospital 
following the Battle of Antietam on September 17, 1862. The battle, which took place near Sharpsburg, Maryland, was the first field army level engagement of the Civil War to be fought on Union soil. With Union General George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac facing the Confederate General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, the Union had a force of 87,164 men and the Confederates just over 38,000. But by the end of the day, a combined total of over 22,000 Americans were dead, wounded, or missing. Over 12,000 from the Union and 10,000 Confederates, resulting in the bloodiest single-day battle in United States military history. Tactically, the result of the conflict was inconclusive, with no clear victor. However, the Confederate Army retreated from its position, abandoning their attempted invasion of the North. Many of the wounded Confederates were transported by rail to Marietta, and since the Fletcher House Hotel was of a good size and located next to the railroad depot, it was an obvious choice for a makeshift hospital. Exact details of how many men came through the Fletcher and ultimately died there are unknown. Then, in July of 1864, Marietta, Georgia fell to General William Tecumseh Sherman and the Union Army as they pressed forward into Atlanta. And for a brief time, the Fletcher was occupied by Sherman himself as his base of operations. But this is where history and local legend become intertwined. When General Sherman eventually gave his men the orders to systematically destroy all buildings and structures in Atlanta that could be used in the South's war effort, some claim he explicitly ordered that this very building to be spared as a favor to Dix Fletcher. So on November 15, 1862, as Sherman and his men abandoned Atlanta, leaving the town in ashes, the Fletcher House Hotel remained one of the only buildings in Marietta still standing. However, the site did in fact catch fire, the result of flying ashes from other buildings, causing the hotel's fourth floor to be consumed by flames. But otherwise, the building was left intact. The fourth floor has never been rebuilt, and to this day, the building remains only three stories tall. Following the Union exodus from the city, Dix Fletcher's hotel remained closed for the remainder of the war and wasn't reopened until 1867 under a new name the Kennesaw House. Fletcher hoped to restore the building's reputation as a, quote, resort destination free from the ice and chill wind of the North and the oppressive heat and relentless bugs of the South. An 1875 advertisement for the business boasts not only of the Kennesaw House, but of the appeal in visiting Marietta, for it was, quote, famous for its refined society, pure water, salubrious climate, and bracing atmosphere. Fortunately, Dix Fletcher was successful, and it was during the era of Reconstruction the Kennesaw House emerged as a first-class hotel where travelers could arrive to find, quote, elegant furniture, comfort, and a hearty meal. The success of the Kennesaw House continued into the 20th century, when it began to undergo a series of renovations, restorations, and changes in ownership. In 1920, 
the building closed its first floor dining room and the space was converted into retail shops. Leaving the upper floors as an operational hotel, they remained active until the 1970s. Then, in 1979, the entire building was renovated. The exterior white facade was removed, exposing the original brickwork, and the interior was completely demolished. Only a few wooden staircases and some of the fireplaces remain from the original hotel today. In 1996, the Marietta Museum of History opened on the second floor of the Kennesaw House. And in the following years, as other tenants left the property, the museum grew first to include the building's third floor, and then finally the first. The museum is still open to the public today, and while it embraces all aspects of Georgia history, one notable feature is a historic reproduction of the room where James J. Andrews spent the night before the start of the great locomotive chase. But as can be found all across the South, in antebellum buildings and homes, tales of lingering spirits are plentiful. Many visitors have reported that when taking the elevator down to the building's basement, the elevator doors open to the site of a gruesomely crowded makeshift hospital. With men screaming in pain, tired surgeons operating on the injured, and blood seemingly everywhere. But upon exiting the elevator and stepping into the bloody scene, the site is said to vanish as if it was never there to begin with. Other claims include the apparition of a man believed to be a Civil War era surgeon who purportedly walks the halls wearing a flat black hat and a cream colored coat. The apparition is believed to be Dix Fletcher's nephew who was a union doctor during the war and was known to have treated family members in this very building. Another ghostly figure that has been reported to inhabit the Kennesaw House is a woman wearing an old-fashioned dress with pink trim, primarily seen by visiting children. It's said that when questioned about what they had seen, these children have purportedly pointed to a portrait that hangs in the house. The portrait of Louisa Fletcher, the wife of Dix Fletcher. In the early 2000s, a group of paranormal investigators visiting the Kennesaw House claimed to have caught what they believed to be photographic evidence of this apparition. But whether she is in fact Louisa Fletcher or someone else is unknown. In the book, Haunted Marietta by Reda Akamatsu, the former director of the Marietta History Museum Dan Cox is reported as being skeptical of the idea of ghosts and believes that most of the experiences people have in the house can be explained away. Nevertheless, Cox said of the Kennesaw House, it's an old house and strange things happen in old houses. Whether Cox is correct in his skepticism or not, 
one thing is in fact true. The Kennesaw House has had a long and storied life, surviving some of the most gruesome events of American history. And if any location might be haunted by the spirits of the Civil War, the Kennesaw House is certainly one. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast written and produced by Brandon and Brianne Schecksneider. For special access to members-only content, including access to the series, Southern Gothic, The Monsters, as well as updates and links to our social media, visit southerngothicmedia.com today. Lucky Lady Shacks.